Welcome back, llamas. In this video, we are going to talk about pitches. One of the most fundamental things in music, we're going back to basics to figure out how do we read them, how do we write them, because that's one of the most important things that musicians have to be able to do. And if you're going to study music theory, you need to know how to read and write pitches, which means we're also going to cover staves, clefs, accidentals, and the layout of the piano keyboard. If that sounds interesting to you, then keep watching. So if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. What is a pitch? Well, a pitch is a specific rate of vibration of air molecules that causes sound. I'm going to differentiate it from a note. A note contains pitch, but it also contains a bunch of other characteristics such as function, timbre, duration, and we're really going to focus today just on that one characteristic, pitch, the rate of vibration that causes sound. Sound is caused by air molecules bumping against each other. So when you play your violin, the vibration of the string causes the air molecules around it to bump against each other at a particular speed. When those air molecules bump against our eardrums, they get converted to electrochemical energy, which is sent through the nervous system to our brains, which interprets the impulse as sound. That energy, that vibration, is measured in hertz, or the number of vibrations per second. So if you ever heard the term A440, the note that most orchestras tune to, the 440 refers to the number of vibrations every second, 440. And it doesn't matter what instrument is playing the note, whether it be a violin or an oboe or a trombone or you're singing it, if it vibrates 440 times per second, you're going to get the note A. Middle C is 261.6 hertz or cycles per second. The lowest note on the piano, an A, is 27 and a half hertz. And the highest note on the piano, a C, is 4186.1 hertz. Most humans can hear from a range of about 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz, although that's highly dependent upon age. Younger people tend to be able to hear much higher than older people. Musical pitch names have three components. First is a letter designation from A through G. Second is an accidental designation, sharps, flats, or naturals. And third is an octave designation. Let's talk about each of those individually. Understanding how the pitch naming system works is often easiest when you picture a piano keyboard. Notice how this keyboard has a repeating pattern of white and black keys. I'll focus in on one instance of this pattern. Letter designations go from A through G, which each successive letter representing one higher note than the previous letter. So, B is one note higher than A, E is two notes higher than C, D is one note lower than E, and because we start over after G, A is one note higher than G. Letter designations repeat after G because notes with the same letter name all share the same general sound and function in music. It is easiest to memorize the locations of pitches based on the groupings of the two or three black keys that are closest to it. For example, the white key immediately below or to the left of the group of two black keys is always C. The one immediately below or to the left of the group of three black keys is always F. There is space to fit another pitch between most notes in our musical system and this corresponds to the black keys on the piano keyboard. This is also why we need to use the accidental designation. A natural denotes no change to the base letter name of the pitch. You can think of natural pitches as being the white keys on a piano keyboard. Adding a sharp to the name of the white key raises the pitch to the key that is between it and the next highest pitch. So, an F-sharp is the pitch that is between an F-natural and a G-natural. In this case, find the F on the keyboard, and then find the black key immediately above that F. That would be F-sharp. A flat lowers the pitch to the one that exists between it and the next lowest pitch. So again, 
find an E on the piano keyboard, find the black key that is immediately below that E, and that becomes E flat. The sharp and flat pitches in most cases correspond to the black keys on a piano keyboard. Now you might notice that each black key could have two names, C sharp or D flat, D sharp or E flat, F sharp or G flat, G sharp or A flat, and A sharp or B flat. This is what musicians call enharmonic equivalence, or two notes sounding the same and sharing the same key on a keyboard. As you get deeper into music theory, you'll learn the situations in which musicians use each name. Spelling does count in music theory, so it does matter which one you use. You probably have also noticed that two pairs of pitches do not have a black key in between them, B to C and E to F. This doesn't mean that a pitch like B-sharp or C-flat doesn't exist. In order to find these pitches, we do the same thing that we did to the other pitches. We go up to the next available piano key. So a B-sharp is enharmonically equivalent to a C-natural. Likewise, a C-flat is enharmonically equivalent to a B-natural. These instances are somewhat rare, but it is important to understand that they might show up in music and so you need to be able to interpret what they mean when you do see them. The third characteristic that pitches have is octave designation. The octave designation shows the highness or lowness of a pitch relative to the piano keyboard. Each octave on the keyboard is given a number starting at 1 and going up to 8. These numbers change at the pitch C in each octave. So the first C on the keyboard is labeled C1, the second one is labeled C2, the third one C3, and so on, all the way up to the last note on the keyboard, C8. Middle C, or the C closest to the middle of the keyboard, is C4. All other pitches between these Cs share the same octave designation, or you could think of it as each pitch shares the same octave designation as the C immediately below it. For example, this pitch is G4 because the closest C below it is C4. This pitch is D sharp 3, and this one is B flat 6. There are three pitches below C1 on most keyboards. These pitches receive the octave designation 0. Now that we know the names of the pitches, we need to be able to read and write them so that we can communicate with other musicians. This is done by placing symbols, called notes, on a staff. A staff consists of five parallel horizontal lines that let us see the relative distances between pitches. Each line represents a particular pitch. The next higher line represents a pitch that is a third, or two letter names, higher than the previous line. If our bottom pitch is D, the next line would represent the pitch F. Likewise, the next lower line from that D represents a pitch that is a third or two letter names lower than the previous line. The line below our D would represent the pitch B. We can place notes between lines indicating pitches that are next to each other. The space above our D indicates the pitch E, one letter name higher, and the space below indicates the pitch C, one letter name lower. Notes that use accidentals will use the corresponding symbol placed before the note that it modifies. A pitch with a sharp in its name would look like this, while one with a flat would look like this. One that uses the accidental designation natural will, will often not use any symbol at all. When one is required, it looks like this. Notice that although we say F sharp, we write it sharp F on the musical staff. When music extends beyond what the staff can accommodate, we can extend the staff for individual notes by using ledger lines. 
there are no limits on how many ledger lines can be used, but the more you use, the harder it is to read, so four or five ledger lines is really the practical limit. If you need to go beyond this, musicians will either change clefs or use an 8VA or 8VB symbol to show that you are playing or singing an octave higher or an octave lower. Staves are neutral until we define the locations of the pitches on them. Any line could refer to any pitch, so we need to make sure that we're defining which line goes with which pitch, and we do that by using clefs. We define the meanings of the lines by using a clef, or a symbol that indicates the location of a particular pitch on the staff. There are three clefs that are commonly used. The G clef, which indicates the position of the pitch G4 by the location of the start of the clef, or where the curl begins. The F clef, which indicates the position of F3, where the curl begins, and in between the two dots and the C clef, which indicates the position of C4 or middle C, where the two arcs meet in the middle. The most common staves in use in modern music are the treble staff, which uses a G clef to place the pitch G4 on the second line of the staff, the bass staff, which uses the F clef to place the pitch F3 on the fourth line, the alto staff, which places the pitch C4 on the third or middle line, and the tenor staff, which places the pitch C4 on the fourth line. The treble staff and the bass staff are by far the more commonly used staves, but there are some instruments that read on the other staves. Once we know the position of one pitch on the staff, we can figure out the locations of all the other pitches relative to it. Although in practical terms, musicians usually memorize the locations of all the pitches on the staves they commonly use. You just don't have time to figure it out as you're reading along in a rehearsal or a performance. You may have used memory aids like Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge and Face to learn the lines and spaces of the treble staff. While this is helpful, it is actually best to simply memorize the locations of the pitches on the staves you are going to be using as you simply won't have time to figure out the pitches while you are reading. Staves can be combined to show a broader range of pitches. This is most commonly done by placing two staves, one treble and one bass, together to form what musicians call a grand staff. The bracket at the left of the two staves that connects them shows that these two staves are to be read simultaneously. There can be some overlap on the grand staff, as the same pitch can be indicated on either staff. When reading, first check the clef, as this will indicate the positions of the notes on the staff. Remember that accidentals precede the pitches they modify. Pay attention to octave designations. The complete names of the following pitches would be A5, G3, D2, B flat 3, F sharp 2, and E flat 6. Reading a little bit every day will help you become proficient and fluent at reading music. So let's review what we've learned in this video. A pitch is a musical sound with a specific rate of vibration. Pitches have three characteristics. First, a letter name, A through G. Second, an accidental, sharp, flat, or natural. And third, an octave designation, which shows where it would be on a piano keyboard. Natural notes correspond to the white piano keys. Most sharp and flat notes correspond to the black keys. Piano keys with two names are enharmonically equivalent. Pitches are notated on staves. A staff consists of five parallel horizontal lines that show the relative position of pitches. Higher pitches appear higher on the staff. Ledger lines extend the staff for individual notes that don't fit on the staff. Staves need clefs to define which pitch corresponds to each given line. From that definition, all other pitches can be determined, but again, it's wise to just memorize 
all the pitch locations on the staves you commonly use. There are three clefs, G, which shows the location of G4, F, which shows the location of F3, and C, which shows the location of C4. The most commonly used staves are the treble staff, which uses a G clef on the second line, the bass staff, which uses an F clef on the fourth line, the alto staff, which uses a C clef on the third line, and the tenor staff, which uses a C clef on the fourth line. Well, that's all for this video. Thank you for watching. If you have any comments, things that you liked, things that uh, you'd like to see in future videos, please leave a comment below. And please remember, if you like these videos, like them and follow them. I'll see you next time.